this will get started. Um, hello everyone, uh, this is Darla Saunders here and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation and the Canadian Rivers Institute, I'd officially like to welcome you to the fourth webinar in our series. Uh, this webinar series is made possible in part thanks to the contribution of the New Brunswick Environmental Trust Fund. We're very pleased today to be hosting Levi Klisch, Manager of Program Delivery with the Clean Annapolis River Project uh, in Nova Scotia, also known as CARP. CARP is an ENGO based in Annapolis Royal with a mission to restore and protect the ecological health of the Annapolis River watershed through science, leadership, and community engagement. Levi has been involved with the organization since 1998 and has delivered a variety of projects ranging from fish habitat and riparian zone restoration work to agricultural greenhouse gas emission reduction projects. So just before we get started, a uh, few housekeeping matters. We're going to save questions for Levi until the end of his presentation. When uh, the question and answer period starts, you can ask a question by using the webinar control panel, which is the little gray box that you should be seeing at the top of your screen. If it's minimized, hit the orange arrow to enlarge it. You can use the audio of your computer by raising your hand, um, that's the little yellow icon, in which case we'll unmute you and you can speak directly to Levi and ask a question. Or you also have the option of typing in your question on the control panel and we'll read it aloud for you during the question and answer session. If none of the above is working, please email me your question and I'll read it aloud. So my email address is darla, D-A-R-L-A, at salmonconservation.ca. So I will now turn the webinar over to Levi. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to have the opportunity to uh, to talk about this project. Um, and um, yeah, I'd like to thank uh, Darla and Michelle for the opportunity to present this to all of you. Uh, so this presentation, what I'd like to do is cover the various steps that led to the removal of the Clemensport Dam. Um, starting with um, some of the preliminary uh, work, the pre-restoration feasibility study um, through to post-removal, the monitoring and what uh, is going to take place for project evaluation in the future. Um, so this really is kind of my perspective on the project um, over time. Um, most of this was seen through, um, well through to the, the actual removal of the dam by Andy Sharp who's the um, science coordinator for CARP. Hello? Sorry everyone, I think Levi's got a, uh, um, a touchy... Uh, Am I back? Yeah, you're back. You must have moved. Yes, you're back. Oh good. Okay, hopefully this doesn't happen too many times. Um, so I'll pick up where I left. Oh no. I'm like, hello? You're good, you're good. You are coming through, you are coming through. Oh, I am, okay. I'm not hearing very well through my uh, through my speakers. Okay, um, so I guess um, I was saying that the project was seen through uh, to the removal by Andy Sharp, who's the science coordinator, was the science coordinator for CARP. Am I still coming through? Yeah, you're okay. Yes, you are, yes. Uh, okay, um, so Andy oversaw the project uh, through to the removal of the dam. Um, I was around, not directly involved in the project um, until afterward, so I got um, involved more through the post-restoration monitoring um, and will be involved through the evaluation of the project. Um, so anyhow, I want to get uh, get going before we take too long on this slide. Um, so the Clemensport Dam project could be seen as uh, part of CARP's overall aquatic connectivity program. Um, so this has been going on since about 2006 where we've been auditing culverts in the watershed. Um, so uh, throughout the project, um, I, I guess well 2006 we had one year of um, culvert identification and restoration um, in which I this was about 16,000 uh, or 1,600 sorry water course road crossings were identified in the watershed. Um, so every year we try to um, try to visit uh, a large portion of these and conduct assessments for fish passability. Um, it seems pretty consistent that every year we find that 50 percent or 55 percent of what we visit are barriers to fish passage, um, which is 
consistent with studies that DFO has conducted. So um, this really has to do with dams. Is it uh, dams? Of course, are another barrier to fish passage. Um, Nova Scotia environment has um, about 602 dams on record in Nova Scotia, and uh, I guess about 57% of rivers entering the Bay of Fundy have barriers. So of course, if um, upstream habitat isn't accessible to anadromous fish, it's going to be difficult to store populations. So on to the Moose River itself. Um, the Moose River is tributary to the Annapolis River. Um, it runs in the Annapolis Basin um, below Annapolis Royal, um, where there is a causeway that, uh, that could be considered a bit of an impediment to fish passage um, and also a potential cause of mortality um, on downstream migration. So luckily the Moose River um, is isolated from that. Um, the dam itself is located about 1.8 kilometers upstream um, of the confluence with the Annapolis Basin, so it cuts off a large portion of the habitat in the, the in the river. Uh, you can see the location of the dam there. Um, the main stem or the west branch of the uh, Moose River is approximately 11 kilometers long. Um, that's where the dam is located. Um, one of the other reasons we looked at the system, the Moose River system, is the pH is pretty well buffered in that system. Um, unlike a lot of rivers in Nova Scotia, it runs through some lime, limestone bearing um, geologic formations. Um, so the pH ranges typically from 6.5 to 7.0. Um, the system historically hosted uh, run large runs of Atlantic salmon. Uh, local residents in the area actually reported fairly recent sightings of Atlantic salmon pooling below the dam um, and were quite concerned because uh, they did mention they were subject to poaching. Um, and uh, yeah, DFO had conducted surveys in the past that had deemed most of the upstream reach on the west branch of the river suitable for spawning and rearing of Atlantic salmon. So the Clementsport Dam itself uh, was built around 1942 by the Department of National Defense. It was to provide a water supply for nearby Cornwallis Naval Base. Um, it was used by DND until about 1967 um, when the adjacent property was sold to Annapolis County um, who held it until the 80s. They uh, leased it to the Clementsport Legion. Uh, the area had been used as a swimming hole uh, from, I guess, the 60s um, onward, but uh, in the 1980s, the Clementsport Legion operated a community swimming park um, complete with picnic areas, lifeguards, and whatnot. Um, over time, they didn't really have the funding or the ability to keep the dam up or to, uh, to monitor the swimming area, so they turned it over to a not-for-profit group. Um, which is no longer active. So the result of that is that uh, over 10 years uh, before the uh, before the dam was actually removed, uh, there was no maintenance done to the dam. So um, high spring flows, spring ice had uh, damaged the dam. Um, there was some undermining that was happening. The system or the dam itself was collapsing, and it was starting to pose a public safety risk. Um, there was a fish ladder on site, um, but again, that wasn't maintained either, so it was wasn't active um, during the time that the uh, that the uh, community group was running the dam. So you can see an upstream view of the dam. Um, you can see the boulder and log crib work um, that's beginning to collapse. Um, and here's a view looking downstream. So you can see again that, uh, that most of the dam structures uh, degraded quite heavily and that there's quite a buildup of sediments behind the dam. Um, I guess um, CARP had the dam in its sight, so to speak, for, for a fair bit of time. There was some community concern about it um, and the fact that it was causing an impediment to fish passage. Um, so really, I guess around 1999, we started seriously looking at the project um, and collecting a bit of baseline data, um, which fed into a feasibility study that took place in 2010. Um, the feasibility study led to a restoration design, a restoration, and throughout the process, um, a lot of monitoring was co collected basically to get a baseline and to monitor the process of the project and um, in the long run to evaluate the success of the project. Um, the feasibility study, I'm going to talk quite a bit on this slide. Um, I know it's not very exciting visually, um, but this is a very important part of the process. Um, CARP hired a, hired a team of consultants, basically it was Par Parish Geomorphic, um, ACOM and McCulloch and Environmental Engineering to complete the study. Um, there were a lot of aspects that were looked at as you can see on the list there. 
Um, one of the first ones, and a bit of a difficult one, was the title search, uh, where the dam or the properties around the dam had changed hands so many times, uh, no one really knew who who owned the dam or wanted to really take responsibility for the dam. So uh, legal counsel had to be retained um, and basically they determined that no party had clear title to the dam. Um, so it was pretty much open open to for removal. Um, they conducted site surveys um, while using various information, historic documents, um, aerial photos, topographic maps, um, a lot of um, well, ground surveys and ground truthing um, just to gain an understanding of the dam's role and impact in the watershed. Um, they developed a hydraulic model. Um, basically they wanted to, to use a hydraulic model to predict the outcomes of various different restoration um, options and, uh, and see how basically well removal or, or other options would, uh, would affect the hydraulics and sediment movement within the system. Um, an archaeological assessment was required um, under the Nova Scotia Special Places Protection Act um, to make sure that the site wasn't of any uh, major historic significance. Um, it was determined that the site was of low archaeological potential. Uh, an engineering review of the dam determined that the dam was at high risk of failure um, and if the dam did fail catastrophically it posed quite a risk to public property and public safety. Um, there's a roadway um, with a with a well, a large culvert downstream um, that uh, that would have potentially been clogged up by the debris from the dam. Um, there's private properties and homes downstream. Uh, the dam itself was was collapsing. It's very accessible to the public, so um, they believe that uh, it was quite a risk to the public. Um, community consultations uh, were to be a pretty important part of this uh, this process. So in July of 2009 and in April of 2010. Um, community uh, consultation meetings were organized in the community itself. Um, these were fairly heavily ad advertised. Uh, about 300 letters were sent out to, to homeowners, residents in the area to try to, to get their participation. Um, the meetings were also advertised in the papers, um, but unfortunately uh, not a lot of attendees uh, came to the meeting. We had I think 10 to 20 um, between the two meetings and uh, yeah there was a uh, Maybe a couple people vocal for each side of you know uh, pro removal or um, or those who wanted to keep it and, and and maintain it as a swimming park in the long run. Um, so unfortunately, really um, because of public apathy, there wasn't uh, really a whole lot that could be brought into the uh, the feasibility study from from that point of view. So in the long run, the conclusion um, was that the complete removal of the dam um, was really the best option. Um, the consultants used a decision matrix basically to remove any bias toward one option or another. Um, so it actually generated a score based on several criteria and it by far complete removal um, had the highest score. Uh, another, uh, another aspect that was taken into consideration was uh, whether or not there was a likely proponent um, for each of the options. So the only ones that really had a, a viable proponent were either to do nothing with the dam or to remove the dam completely. Um, so Again, because of the, uh, the the hazards to public safety uh, that were inherent with doing nothing, uh, the complete removal was the option that was preferred. Of course, any project like this uh, needs a decent design, uh, permitting and funding. So, um, yeah, basically uh, the restoration was designed, uh, well, it was developed by Parish Jim Morphic with input from CARP, um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the Gulf of Maine Council on the Marine Environment. Um, they're both um, partners throughout the project and uh, and uh, contributed a great deal of experience and knowledge to the to the project itself. Um, we need to get release documents from adjacent landowners. So those were um, some of the the people who uh, had owned the property in the past um, and owned it bits of adjacent land, so the, the county of Annapolis, uh, the province of Nova Scotia, the federal government, as well as a couple of private landowners that, uh, that live nearby. Um, we needed a water course alteration permit, obviously. Um, it was quite heavy work being done in channel, so that was obtained from Nova Scotia Environment and Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And where the uh, consultants had estimated that the cost of the removal of the dam would cost about $260,000, um, a lot of funding applications went into quite a wide variety of, uh, of funding, funding sources. So 
um, basically throughout that process and leading into the to the dam removal, a lot of pre-restoration baseline monitoring took place. Um, so we'd have an idea of um, how the system was functioning and what the habitat quality was like before it was taken out. We can compare it with some of the post-restoration work. Um, fish habitat utilization was conducted using fight net surveys um, in 2009, and this actually fed into the um, to the consultant's report as well. Water quality was conducted regularly by uh, CARP staff using a, a data sonde, um, in this case a Quanta Hydro Lab, to measure the parameters that you, uh, that you see on the screen. Benthic invertebrates have been uh, been sampled since 2009 at the site annually. Um, they're sampled using the cabin protocols. Uh, photo point stations were were established at four different sites um, along the restoration site. Um, so basically determined uh, an angle and a height to take pictures from, uh, looking upstream, downstream, and across the dam in both directions, uh, just so we can get an idea um, of the changes in channel, um, riparian vegetation, etc. over the course of the project. And monumented cross sections in 2009 were established by uh, students from the Center for Geographic Sciences, or COGS, uh, locally. So they established 15 monumented cross sections um, that uh, that we could later use uh, for some of our measurements. So I'll get into that a little bit, a uh, little further into the presentation. So a little more on the fish habitat utilization. Um, just wanted to mention this because uh, it was actually conducted by local volunteers. Um, what they did, uh, they wanted to determine whether or not uh, there was actually a remnant population of Atlantic salmon um, or other anadromous species of concern um, in the area. So they set a fight net uh, about 400 meters up from the Annapolis Basin, so well below the dam site itself. Um, on September 7th of 2009, um, it was left in place and checked every 24 hours until October 4th, 2009. Um, if no one was able to, to actually check the net on a 24-hour basis, it was able to be closed shut so that uh, it wouldn't actually you know, trap anything and um, risk actually well, leaving things in there until they died. So. Um, anyway, this determined that there were remnant populations of salmon um, in the stream. There are also brook trout utilizing the, uh, using the stream as well as um, quite a few American eel. So on the restoration, um, I guess um, it wasn't just a matter of throwing a stick of dynamite at the dam, um, letting it go and letting the river flow through. Um, the consultants from Parish Geomorphic um, who, who actually um, did the restoration design um, had quite a few actions that they had identified as necessary if we were going to remove the dam. Um, I'll get into these in a little more detail, but uh, just to give you the list. Um, so. An overview of the area itself. Um, I guess here's the dam, um, the fishway on this side, um, on the eastern bank, um, and a bit of a concrete abutment here. Um, you can see, I guess, above at the head of the head pond area, um, a cobble bar. This is actually accumulated, uh, accumulated large alluvial sediments that have built up over time um, because of the slowing of velocity. So um, there's a bit of a gradient between here and here. Um, I'll get in that the sediments would have to be removed from the head pond area. Um, there's also a bit of land forming around here, the picnic area. Um, again, on this side, there was an earthen embankment that was used to, to retain some of the flood waters um, as they built up behind the dam. Um, we also had a road to contend with, so uh, the Clementsport Road runs extremely close to the river. At some points, um, I guess the horizontal distance is only a few meters, four or five meters. Um, so this bank has actually built up a um, really large boulder and the road built, beds built on top of it. So um, there was some concern about uh, undermining of the, the roadway, um, potential impacts to, to well, provincial property um, and, and public roadway. So uh, step by step, the removal process was to, um, to start with the earthen embankment um, alongside the dam and regrade it. Um, so it was quite steep. I can't give you the exact ratio off the top of my head, but um, it was regraded to a three to one. Um, so this was to provide greater stability. Um, of course, while we're working on site, uh, erosion control measures were used to prevent sedimentation and, of course, erosion of the bank. Um, so 
what happened is this was pulled back um, at the foot of it, uh, erosion control blanket was, uh, was installed and then boulder was installed along the foot of the, the bank. Um, the disturbed soils along the top, as soon as the excavator was moved away, um, was covered in hay, seeded and then later planted with trees. So you can see here exactly where the, well, generally where the area is that, that work took place. Um, the actual removal of the fish ladder and the dam itself took very little time. Um, extremely easy. Um, they used a, an excavator with a thumb attachment on it to, to basically break apart the dam and lift it out by chunks. Um, the pieces were then transported off site and, and disposed of. So again, this is the area where that took place. Um, at this point, the concrete abutment on this side where they're standing here um, wasn't removed. It was left in place till, uh, until some of the other work had, had uh, taken place. Up in the area um, where I mentioned uh, there had been some buildup of, uh, build of sediments, cobbles and whatnot, um, the stream bed had to be regraded. Um, so the sediments at this point had been removed from the impoundment area and there's you know, a fair change in slope between these two. Um, the base of the, the river had changed here but not quite so much here. Um, so a lot of the, the material here was removed, um, some of it put aside for, for some later work that was going to be done on site. Um, Anyhow, so the three riffles in this area were constructed to, to help slow the water flow through the area and to, and to make for a little bit more complex habitat. Also, where the bank on this side had been built up somewhat and was subject to erosion and also keeping the river from accessing its floodplain in this general area, uh, it was regraded um, in order to allow that and then stabilized with, with hay and grass, um, similarly to, to the area where the earthen embankment was. And I had mentioned the roadway earlier and the, the risk uh, of eroding under the roadbed. So um, the consultants had had recommended that uh, three deflector weirs be built alongside the roadbed to allow for the accumulation of, uh, of debris, well, of um, substrate in the area alongside the roadbed um, to, to bolster it, as well as to try to divert the channel flow a little more eastward um, so that it wouldn't be causing any issues in here. Um, so those, well, of course, were built at the same time, um, 2011. Uh, most, of, most of the hydrological, I guess the design was, uh, was based on two-year high flows. Uh, unfortunately, I guess last winter we didn't have a lot of snow, we didn't get a really good freshet, so we haven't really seen those function um, the way they were expected to at this point. So hopefully this year, if we get a good freshet, um, we'll see some, uh, some accumulation in this area and a bit more of the channel moving over here. At this point, there's a bit of a, a gravel bar in the center here, and we have a bit of a split channel going around both sides. Um, upstream, um, they identified a risk of, uh, of head cut. So where um, the channel uh, see, within this area had been regraded so much, um, I guess there was a risk that uh, that the river would continue to uh, to erode the stream, uh, the stream bed upstream of that area um, and continue to cut back. So what had happened um, in the upstream margin of influence um, of the dam, what they did was uh, excavated the stream bed um, and installed a really large boulder at grade um, and then bolstered the, um, the stream bank on the, on the western bank which was, which was uh, quite steep and well cut into eroding at the at the time. On this side, the stream bank's quite shallow. Um, it's more or less floodplain, so um, there's very little risk of erosion in this area. The final step using heavy equipment uh, was to remove the concrete abutment on the eastern bank. Uh, and this was done um, using the excavator, broke it apart, ripped it out in chunks, carted it off site, fairly straightforward. At the end of all this, the site pretty much looked like scorched earth. Um, there had been a lot of equipment through there. Um, basically, there was a lot of uh, gravel, cobble, whatnot, disturbed soil. So um, there was a lot of effort to, to stabilize and revegetate the site. Um, again, using hay and seeding in a lot of the disturbed soil areas. Um, also, pretty much immediately had students come out from the Nova Scotia Community College um, who helped to plant some of the trees that actually had been uh, scavenged when, uh, when some of the regrading had happened. So um, we'd put some trees aside and replace them in the area that had been disturbed. Uh, they're still doing quite well. 
Also, at the time, they used um, they used some willow stakes, planted willow stakes that we'd saved over the summer, um, left over from another project to to try to to get that vegetation started. Um, unfortunately, it was quite late in the year, and uh, they'd already flushed a bit, so most of those weren't successful. Um, however, this spring we did have staff go out uh, with dormant stakes and plant 600 um, in the area, a lot of which actually took quite well. So these are a combination of willows and red osier dogwood. You can see along the margin here. Um, yeah, they sprouted. Whoops, they sprouted quite well. Um, here we go. Oh no. I had gone back. And uh, yeah, in the spring we also had uh, the Middleton Girl Guides come out. They would purchased um, 50, 50 potted trees, so a combination of yellow birch, um, red oak, uh, American elder, and highbush cranberry, and planted those on the site in freezing cold temperatures. They did really well, and uh, yeah, all those trees are doing, doing excellently. So here you can see gravel bar um, a little farther um, in, into the downstream reach where uh, the willow stakes are actually starting to sprout. Uh, this is a bit late in the spring. So again, these are still doing quite well. They put on pretty good whips and, uh, and they seem to have fared quite well. So for post-restoration monitoring, um, this most of these things were done throughout, um, well, from pre-restoration um, through to, to the restoration and continue now. Um, water quality was conducted at minimum monthly at four sites, so one site below the dam, um, three sites above. Uh, again, using a multi-parameter data son, um, either a YSI or a Quanta Hydro Lab. Uh, we had data loggers um, since 2009, both below the dam site and above the dam site, um, tracking water temperature. Uh, those, I think, that they were taken out about a month ago. Um, we've yet to download the data from this year and compare it to previous years. Um, that's going to be done um, in the evaluation of the project. Stream discharge, again, was, uh, was collected throughout the project. Um, several different sites, so downstream of the restoration site, upstream of the restoration, um, immediately upstream that is, and two control site, sites that were several kilometers upstream. So this to, to measure the hydrologic impact on um, the of the dam removal. Uh, benthic invertebrates, which I mentioned before, have continued. Um, we sampled them again this year. Uh, anecdotally, I guess, um, when uh, when we were sampling the head pond area of the dam previously, um, we were picking up a lot of uh, leeches and snails and that, and organisms that indicate fairly poor water quality. Um, the year of the removal is only, well, we'd, uh, we'd done that cabin sampling about a month after after the equipment moved out of there, so we didn't see a whole lot of anything. Um, but this year, it seems to be getting colonized with um, quite a few mayflies and stoneflies, so it seems to be pretty encouraging. Um, photo point stations again continue. Um, I've already explained those, so I won't go into that anymore. Um, other than the fact that a lot of the times when we go to the site for other reasons, um, we do take photos. Uh, the monumented cross sections were finally used. So um, we used the 15 monumented cross sections um, to do cross sectional profiles um, of the uh, of the dam uh, post restoration and. That will be done um, annually. Uh, we just actually got done this year's, uh, this week. A little cold in there, but um, anyhow, we're getting tr cross sectional profiles, um, foul wag depths to get long longitudinal profiles of the channel to track changes in the channel over time um, post removal. We also um, are using some of those cross sections to conduct vegetation surveys within the project area, so that we can get uh, so that we can track um, changes in vegetation from the revegetation re efforts, and also from natural or natural colonization. Um, grain size anal analysis: we use woman 100 pebble counts, um, basically ran randomly grabbing 100 uh, pieces of substrate uh, from from the transect and, uh, and measuring them just to, to get an idea of the uh, the general makeup of the substrate so over time we'll be able to track changes in, in substrate composition um, resulting from the dam removal and fish passage assessment um, we conducted electrofishing surveys immediately before the dam removal um, at <clears throat> four sites one below the dam uh, one within the work area and then two upstream um, and uh, this was done in 2011, also post removal in 2012. Um, unfortunately, no salmon yet, but it's still fairly early. I hope to get out again um, and assess the site in future years. So, 
anyhow, there's some photos of some of the post restoration monitoring work. Um, this is a staff member conducting uh, some of the pebble count, measuring some of the substrate, um, discharge surveys, uh, measuring water quality, and here's a brook trout caught in our electrofishing surveys. So this is a view of the dam before restoration. I showed this picture before, but I wanted to contrast it with a view, um, I guess this spring, um, post restoration, what it looks like today pretty much. Um, so it's a nice clear upstream view of the stream. Um, as you can see, there's, uh, well, just barely, there's a bit of a braid there. Um, so the water is actually, there's a fair channel coming around here that you can't quite see in the picture. Um, but over time, what we're hoping to see is uh, the stream should hopefully follow this course through and that uh, the channel will be a little more defined in this area and vegetation will build in, in these areas. So on to lessons learned. Um, I'm going to, if you'll forgive me for it, uh, read these out. These are actually Andy's observations. I thought it'd be appropriate to, to include them here where he was uh, he was very directly involved in the entire process of the removal, um, well, and also the pre-restoration pre-restoration work. So, um, yeah, just to read directly from uh, from Andy's notes, it takes time and money to remove dams. So, what he's got to say is that restoration projects take time to conceive, evaluate, design, undertake, and monitor. So, be prepared for multiple years from start to finish. Every dam removal has issues. Every project will likely have one or more problems that must be addressed before work can proceed. Um, so these might be archaeological remains, contaminated sediments, etc. Um, in our case, it was property ownership. Following a title search and legal review, it was determined that it was unclear who owned the dam. So hard to pin responsibility on one person for the removal. Dam removals can yield significant habitat gains. So one single dam restoration can yield access to many kilometers of spawning and rearing habitat. In the case of the Clementsport Dam removal, approximately 19 kilometers up of upstream habitat was gained. And finally, dam removals are messy. <clears throat> um, so removing wood, sediments, and concrete around moving water is challenging. Um, it's difficult to pump water around, control the sediments, um, you know, minimize impacts. You ensure lots and lots of advanced conversation with key regulators to identify concerns and discuss project plan. Um, so short-term effects, um, days to weeks from the construction can address long-term barriers that may have been around for decades. And that's the end of the pre presentation. So thanks very much for the opportunity again. Um, and thank you to all our funders. Um, there were many. I don't think they could all fit on this page, but uh, the vast majority are here. Thank you, Levi. That was excellent. Um, it's fascinating to hear all of the steps and work that's required behind the scenes to do something like a dam removal. It's, uh, that was really instructive and helpful. Thank you. Thank so you. we'll open the floor now to question and answers. So again, you can ask a question by raising your hand using the little yellow icon and we can unmute um, you so that you can speak aloud or you can type in your question. So perhaps, uh, Levi, maybe while we're waiting for folks to enter their questions and to get in line to ask questions, I have a quick question. So sure. you had referred a few times to title search for the actual dam. Um, yes. So is a, is a dam structure something that is typically owned like a piece of property? Um, yeah, I believe so. Um, in the case of, say, like an active... Um, hydroelectric dam, um, I believe the proponent of the dam itself would, would be considered an owner. Okay, oh, so that's fascinating. A, so when a dam becomes uh, derelict, I guess that's one of the one of the big things to, to look for, is uh, who's actually responsible for it. Okay, we have oh, that is really interesting. That's something, an aspect of the dam that I hadn't, hadn't known about before. Okay, I'm going to unmute, um, oh, there goes my phone. I'm going to unmute Josh, who has a question from online. Sure, this is Josh. Uh, Levi, I'm wondering, as far as the um, baseline monitoring and post-monitoring, if you had to, um, not necessarily as cost-cutting, but uh, as far as, as reporting out success of the project, are there some of the measures that you um, 
would focus more energy on and, and if you did have limited dollars that you would say, well, this, this really helped us prove that the project was successful, therefore, uh, you know, we would use these data to try to convince another dam project of, of, the, of the success. Um, that's a bit hard to say right at this point. Um, we haven't really done the post-restoration evaluation of the project, but uh, what we based um, our, our baseline monitoring on um, was actually a document um, by the GOMC, so it was um, actually a stream burial removal uh, monitoring guide um, that uh, that really lays out uh, what, what information is necessary. So in a sense, I almost see this as... Uh, Maybe being the minimum, really, um, in terms of what uh, what should be monitored. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And do you, you used a lot of volunteers for this? Do you have an idea of the uh, other costs associated with it, or was it really pulled together with students and and uh, and agency folks? Um, actually, volunteers were a relatively small part. Um, a lot of it was conducted by paid staff. Um, I mean, we did have a lot of uh, in-kind support from um, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, um, as I said before, um, NOAA and, uh, and the GOMC. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the cost to ourselves to implement the project was uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay. Good segue into, we got a question from Will Brunner online. Uh, he says, just wondering about the process of getting the regulators, in brackets, DFO, on side. Was it difficult to get work started? Um, in a nutshell, yes. Um, there were some challenges um, and maybe some different uh, philosophies involved in, um, well, basically uh, risks of uh, sediment transportation, et cetera, and just, uh, just how involved um, some of the channel work had to be, um, so took a lot of negotiation um, between some of the various, uh, well, I guess uh, people providing technical input before um, the option that uh, that was presented to, was actually come to. Um, so I mean, on various sides, some people thought basically removing the dam and then allowing um, allowing the stream to basically take its course was the best option, um, and that ranged from basically that end to completely re reconstructing the channel and the entire reach. So this was a bit of a compromise in between the two approaches. All right, thank you. And then we have another one from uh, Anita Doucette. Um, she says, can I have a copy of this presentation? And yes, Anita, we're, we'll have a recording, but we can, if Levi's okay with it, we can also send out a PDF. Um, but she also says, and perhaps your reports. Um, the reports are available online, um, so our website's www.annapolisriver.ca, um, and if you look on the program areas um, or our archives, you can actually access uh, the vast majority of the reports that we produce, including um, the ones that provide some background information to this. Um, in terms of the presentation, I wouldn't mind uh, making a couple changes to the notes underneath before uh, it's shared. But uh, otherwise, I don't see a problem. Okay. She's got another question, but I'll just, there's another one that came in from Ke Kevin Garraway online. It says, did you run any, into any challenges with getting an approval from NSE? Is that Nova Scotia Environment, I'm supposing? Yes. Yeah, that would be, uh, that would be NSE. Um, I don't know. I don't think it was too much of a problem. Um, you'd really, Andy would be the best person to answer that question. Um, he's the one that went through that process. Um, so yeah, I can't really answer that directly. Okay, we got another one from Anita Doucette. Why not let the water flow reestablish the bottom of the river instead of going in and taking out the sediment with the machines? Um, well, I mean, there's quite a lot of sediment buildup um, behind the dam. Uh, seeing as it was constructed in 1947, it had a lot of time to accumulate. So. Um, there's quite a bit of risk to um, to some of the habitat downstream. So we had 1.8 kilometers of habitat that was currently being accessed by by Atlantic salmon, um, and you know, um, allowing that many finds to go in through the system could have caused issues. So it was best to to remove at least a, a portion of those um, before before removing the dam. Perfect. I don't have any more online right now unless someone wants to jump in and either raise your hand or type in your question and I can ask for you. And once and twice. 
Any other questions, Michelle? No. No, I don't see any. Okay, I haven't gotten anything by email either, so I think we'll call this the end of the presentation. Levi, thank you so much. That was excellent, really informative, and a great step-by-step -step description of what the whole process entailed and, and how you were able to pull off such a successful project. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Yeah, it was great to, to have the opportunity to do this. Excellent. So I'd just like to remind everyone uh, that the next webinar will be in the new year, 2013. Uh, Dr. Rick Kunjak of UNB CRI will be providing an overview of new scientific research in our field. This will be taking place on Wednesday, January 16th. The presentation itself will be in English, but there will be a bilingual question and answer session. The next presentation uh, will be in French. It's David Leblanc of the Restigouche River Watershed Management Council, and he's going to be discussing habitat assessment on February 13th. This is going to be a French presentation, but there will be um, a bilingual question and answer session. All, registration for all upcoming webinars in our series is available on the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation website under the resources link. So thank you again, everyone, for participating. We are, we're really pleased to have had you here today, and we hope you'll be able to take part in the next webinar. Thank you.